Hey folks, welcome back. There is this interesting topic in physics called power, something that we've all heard of, but it kind of gets lumped in in our discussion most of the time with things like energy or electricity, and it can be tough to parse out what exactly does power mean in physics. So, our definition in physics for power is the rate at which energy changes from one form to another, or energy is transferred from one object to another, or work is done by one object onto another. So it's how rapidly each of those things happens. So, for example, if I were to lift up a 100-pound rock, one meter, we could say that I did a certain amount of work on that rock. And if I did it quickly versus if I did it slowly, the work wouldn't change at all. The work would be the same amount in each case, but the power would be different because power uh, describes the rate at which work is being done. Now, as an equation, we can write out power in a couple of different ways here. We have this uh, work over time, and we have change in energy over change in time. Now, the delta E there, that can get subbed out for something like delta K for dealing with kinetic energy, or delta UG if it's gravitational potential energy, or uh, you know any other energy type that um, that we might want to include there, electric potential energy or thermal energy or anything can go in there. Any energy type or combination of energy types is fine there as well. For the units on this, we use watts by um, um, for standard um, system, the metric system. Um, watts are the same as joules per second. So if I have a 60 watt light bulb. That means that that light bulb is using 60 joules of energy every second. So if I let it go for two seconds, it would use 120 joules. Three seconds would be 180 joules. The other unit that you would have seen for um, power would be horsepower. And horsepower is the English system unit. And this is used for um, and typically things that are, are bigger power users, like engines. Um, and so a horsepower is the same as 746 watts and is in fact based on the power output of a horse pulling a carriage. It's exactly what it sounds like. Um, but we'll stick with watts for most applications in physics. Um, so let's now uh, try out some manipulations of that. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm getting the right pen here. Um, of that equation to uh, um, see what we could do with it. So one thing that we might recall here is that work can be calculated as force times distance or displacement really. Um, and if we have some angle between force and displacement, we need to have cosine theta in there. So often that's written as F D cosine theta. And so we can plug that in and we know power is equal to work over time. So instead of work, I'm just going to put in F D cosine theta over delta T. So if I know my force and distance and angle there, I can find, you know, I could do this in two steps, force times time, distance times cosine theta to get work and then divide by time to get power. Um, but a neat little trick that, uh, that pops up sometimes here <coughs> Notice that here we've got d over delta t, and d over delta t, distance or displacement over time, that's the same as average velocity. So if we happen to know the average velocity, or if it's traveling at a constant velocity, then that would be the average velocity. We could also say that power is equal to force times the average velocity times cosine theta. Now that's really handy for problems like um, a car is traveling at 30 meters per second um, and the engine is providing this amount of force um, as, as the car is traveling. What's the power output of the engine? Um, or here's what the power output is and what would the force be? Um, so constant velocity problems tend to work really nicely with that form of the equation. Other things that we could do with this though, we could say um, kinetic energy instead of just general energy, kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. So that would lead us to an equation like power 
would be equal to say kinetic energies but it's changing in some problems so maybe car is accelerating from rest or from one speed to another or slowing down from one speed to another um, instead of just energy we would say delta k over delta t the change in kinetic energy and so the change in kinetic energy is going to be k minus k naught or the ending energy minus the starting energy divided by delta t and so we can get to an equation like one half mv squared minus one half m v naught squared so not it's not that it's not being squared it's that it's the original speed being squared on that second term divided by delta t and you can simplify this a little bit you can pull out a one half and an m from both terms there so we have the one half m and then it's a v squared minus v naught squared all over delta t or combine the one half and the m and the delta t there we get p equals m over two delta t and that's times v squared minus v naught squared so you know that can be a useful little um, uh, manipulation of this again you can break all this down into steps. Um, find the if you have two speeds, find the kinetic energy that you start with and the kinetic energy you end with, and figure out how much that changes, and divide that by time. Sometimes though, you don't have all those those little pieces to work with. Oh, computer's almost dying here, so better better make this fast. Um, so one last example then, UG, gravitational potential energy. Typically, we do that as m g delta y or mgh is what you see commonly as well so then power if we're say raising an elevator at constant speed it's the gravitational potential energy that's doing the changing there this also gets a delta on it sometimes um, so power would be delta ug over delta t and again that's ug minus ug naught the ending minus the starting gravitational potential energy delta t so power would be equal to mg delta y minus mg delta y naught the starting potential energy uh, on over on this term and the ending potential energy over on this term and that's all divided by delta t you can pull the mg's out again mg over delta t and we have y minus y naught or delta y minus delta y naught remember on that one the delta just means where is your position compared to the reference level um, so usually we would just say the ground or the floor is our zero or is our reference level for potential energy so the delta y just means where is that object compared to what we said is a zero at the ground level there all right so that's all our, our uh, hypotheticals let's do an example problem next one problem that shows up pretty frequently in these is an elevator problem looking for power output on the elevator. So in this one, we're going to start with the elevator at rest. We've got a mass given to us, and I like to just put down numbers with variables as I work through these. So I'm just going to put down mass at 1,000 kilograms. Um, it starts from rest, so I've got V0 at 0. Uh, 20 seconds later, that sounds like a time measurement. Delta T is 20 seconds. The elevator is moving upward at 2.0 meters per second. So V is 2.0 meters per second and is 30 meters above where it started. Okay, so we don't know where exactly it started, but we get to define our reference levels on these. So I'm going to say that the starting height, the delta Y naught, is going to be zero and the ending height delta y is going to be 30 meters above that so positive 30 meters all right we've also got the speed is positive 2.0 me meters per second upward um, the velocity is upward it's all we need here is speed so it doesn't matter but we've got the information why not write it down um, and we are looking for the average power output so that is a p equals question during those 20 seconds. Now, I see that we've got uh, information about mass and speed and height here. That sounds like it's set up pretty well to do energy considerations. Mass and speed gets us kinetic energy. 
mass and height and knowing gravity that gets us potential energy, gravitational potential. So let's set it up that way. So our equation then is going to be P is equal to delta E over delta T. Now in this case, our starting energy and our ending energy are going to be combinations of potential and kinetic energy. So I'm just going to go ahead and write this out as E minus E naught divided by delta T, so our ending minus our starting energy. And then in the next line, I'm going to show that that starting energy is composed of both kinetic and gravitational potential energy. And then minus the E naught, which is also composed of kinetic and gravitational potential energy, but I'll put the little subscript zero in there, show that those are initial values. And that's all divided by our delta T. Next up, we're going to put in equations for these. So kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. 1 half mv squared. Gravitational potential energy, that's mg delta y. And then over here, we'll have exactly the same thing, just with the subscript of 0 for the initial values instead of the final values. So 1 half m v naught squared plus m g delta y naught. Ooh, tight fit over there. All right, and that's all divided by delta t. And I know there are some zeros that go in here, and I'm going to save myself a little space later on by putting in any zeros I can. I said delta v naught, uh, sorry, delta y naught and v naught were both zeros. So v naught here that's zero, and delta y naught, that's zero. So this whole term here is gonna drop to zero. So all I have to worry about is that final value that I've defined every, I've defined the reference level so that my starting gravitational potential energy is zero. It wasn't moving, so kinetic energy was zero as well. So initial energy is set at zero then. So then power, and that's gonna be equal to, uh, we've got one half, times the mass, that was a thousand kilograms, times the final speed, which we had listed as two meters per second, squared, plus, and then we got a thousand kilograms, times 9.8 meters per second squared, times, ooh, what was that final height? Uh, 30 meters. And that's all divided by our time, which was 20 seconds. All right, and since I've just got this S over here for seconds, I'm gonna do that down here too. All right, so then power equals, and at this point I'm just gonna calculate values for the kinetic and potential energy separately. So uh, let's say I've got the two squared is four, the one half takes that back down to a two times a thousand is 2000. And that's kilogram meters squared per second squared or joules. So short would write that, joules plus, okay, 1000 times 30 times 9.8. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do that on here. I'm worried I'm going to miss a decimal on this one. 1,000 times 9.8 times 30. Uh, okay, we got it all. It's 294,000 joules. All right, and we can see that the kinetic energy here just doesn't make that much of a difference. It's the potential energy that's, uh, that's where it's at, and that makes sense. The elevator, you know, we expect most of the work is moving things up and down, not getting them moving fast. All right, divided by 20 seconds. Okay, and then our power total is going to be, let's see, 294,000 plus 2,000 is 296,000. Sorry, that's our energy total, not power total divided by 20 seconds. And so then power is, let's add in the 2,000 here, and then divide by 20 seconds. 
And we get to our 14,800, and that is joules per second or watts. And in case we are interested here, let's go ahead and divide that by 746. It's our conversion to horsepower, and that tells us this would be a 19.8 horsepower output. It's not necessarily the horsepower of the motor itself, but what it's outputting at that moment, probably not operating at its highest level possible. So either of these would be acceptable answers for the power output on that motor lifting the elevator up. So every situation is a little different. You kind of just have to analyze what approach you want to take, whether you want to think about work uh, in terms of forces and distances, or whether you want to look at energies, changes in energies there. Um, once you identify energy types that are changing, plugging those into the energy equation, that's pretty straightforward, but you know, these conceptually can be a little difficult, but really it just comes from an understanding of energy, what types of energy there are and when they're present. All we're doing after that point is dividing my time. So if you know the energy stuff, the power stuff comes pretty naturally as long as you can keep those straight. Hey, thanks very much for watching folks. I appreciate your time. If you found this video useful, please do like, share, and subscribe for future videos. Thank you.